Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India The topic we are going to discuss today is infarction. What is infarction? It is an area of ischemic necrosis caused by sudden occlusion of either the arterial supply or the venous drainage in any tissue. A good example for this is myocardial infarction. What then do we mean by ischemia? Ischemia means a relative decrease in the blood supply to a tissue resulting in hypoxia. The necrosis that results from that is called ischemic necrosis. Most of the infarctions we see in tissues result either from thrombosis or thromboembolic events. What are the causes for infarction? We can classify these as arterial, venous and microcirculation causes. The factors that cause arterial occlusion may be intraluminal, intramural or extravascular. The intraluminal causes include thromboemboli, large atherosclerotic plaques with or without superimposed thrombi. The mural clauses are those which involve the wall of the blood vessel thereby vasospasm and vasculitis or inflammation of the blood vessels. Extravascular causes are those that cause compression of the blood vessels, for example, tumors, inflammatory adhesions, torsion or twisting of an organ on its pedicle, and tight ligatures. Whenever arterial occlusion is the cause for infarction, ischemic necrosis is seen within the tissue. Venous causes similarly can be divided into the intraluminal causes like mesenteric venous thrombosis, deep vein thrombosis or cavernous sinus thrombosis. Intramural causes include varicose veins, phlebitis, and the extramural causes include strangulation, say for example of a hernia, intussusception or volvulus. In these situations, because of the blockage of the venous circulation, there is stagnation and hypoxia which when prolonged results in infarction of the organ. Microcirculation causes can also result in infarction of tissue. If the circulation is blocked by red cells, for example in sickle cell anemia, or in polycythemia vera, increased white cell counts as seen in chronic myeloid leukemia, formation of fibrin thrombi in the microcirculation as seen in disseminated intravascular coagulation, and excessive pressure causing compression of the microcirculation as seen in bed sores are all causes for infarction of tissue. What then are the factors which influence infarction in the tissue? The general circulation of the tissue and the status of the cardiovascular system are important. If an individual is anemic, then the slightest cause for hypoxia will cause infarction of the tissue. If a patient has sickle cell anemia, the sickle RBCs block the microcirculation and therefore any other cause for hypoxia will easily predispose to infarction. Similarly, in congestive cardiac failure and when there is blood loss. The anatomic patterns of blood supply of various tissues also predispose tissues to infarction. For example, 
organs which have dual blood supply like the liver and the lung are relatively protected. Parallel arterial systems as seen in the hands and forearm also prevent infarctions as the artery can be compensated by the other vessels present in the area. However, if there is a single artery without any anastomosis and it is blocked, definitely it would lead to infarction of the tissue. If the single artery had a network of arteries or arcades as is seen in the mesentery of the intestine, it could protect against infarction. On the contrary, end arteries supplying a tissue results in infarction if that particular artery is blocked. There are many other factors that influence the severity of infarction in tissue. For example, the state of collateral circulation. If a tissue is developing ischemia over a period of time, collaterals develop and therefore they prevent from infarction. However, if the collateral circulation is not good and the vessel is blocked, an infarction will result in the given tissue. The rate of development of the occlusion, a sudden occlusion, say for example by a thromboembolus, does not give time for any compensatory or collateral circulation to develop. It would result in immediate infarction of the tissue. Vulnerability of the tissue to ischemia. The neurons, myocardial cells are highly prone to ischemic necrosis. Hence, the type of tissue that is subjected to hypoxia matters. The extent of obstruction in a vessel also determines the degree of infarction. A small obstruction in a small vessel means only a small infarct results. However, occlusion of a larger vessel would mean a larger area of a tissue or even an entire organ undergoing infarction. The blood oxygen content as we described earlier also determines infarction. For example, hypoxic states would result in easier development of infarction in the tissue. The infarcts are of different types when different characteristics are taken into consideration. If we look at the color of the infarct, traditionally infarcts are divided into white infarcts and red infarcts. The white infarcts are also known as pale infarcts, the red infarcts are also known as hemorrhagic infarcts. The presence or absence of infection, the infarct can be reclassified as bland infarct or septic infarct. For example, if a bland embolus blocks the vessel, coagulative necrosis is of the bland type. Whereas if a septic embolus blocks a vessel, superadded inflammation and suppuration results in a septic infarct. Infarcts can also be classified according to the age of the infarct. A freshly developed infarct is often referred to as a new infarct or an early infarct, whereas one which has undergone organization and healing by scarring is called a healed infarct. Infarcts can be further classified according to their location. So if it is in the heart, we say myocardial infarction, similarly cerebral, pulmonary, renal, splenic, bowel infarction. Infarcts can lastly be classified again according to the process of development. Most of the infarcts are developed as pathologic processes and therefore are pathological infarctions. Some however are induced or iatrogenic. For example, when a therapeutic embolization is done it is called an induced infarction of a tumor. Similarly, when an FNAC procedure is done due to some arterial compromise occurring in the lesion, an induced infarction results in the tumor. This is called an FNAC induced infarction. The morphology of infarcts, we will look at the gross features first. Most infarcts are wedge shaped and why this is so I will explain in a little while. Grossly we also identify the morphology based on the color of the infarct. So as I have already told you we have the pale or the white infarcts and the red or the hemorrhagic infarcts. 
Similarly, the gross morphology varies depending on whether it is bland or septic. A septic infarct will have a central liquefied area due to suppuration. Usually when we see infarcts, we say that they are wedge shaped. The apex of the wedge is the location where the occluded vessel is located and the base is formed by the periphery of the organ or the tissue in which the infarction has occurred. We know that when an artery supplies a blood, an organ, it divides dichotomously and branches into smaller and smaller vessels as it distributes itself throughout the parenchyma of that organ. This is depicted in this figure. Imagine now if one of these vessels is occluded by say a thromboembolus. Now the area supplied by that particular vessel will get blocked and therefore infarcted. Therefore, when we look at this morphology, we can understand why an infarct is wedge shaped. As I said, the apex will be directed towards the blocked vessel. The base will be formed by the periphery of the organ, that is the very end to which that artery or vein distributes its branches. So therefore, when we look at infarcts, invariably we find this characteristic wedge shaped morphology. White infarcts usually result when there is arterial occlusion and stoppage of blood flow into a given area of tissue. It is most often seen in solid organs like the kidney, the liver, the spleen. It is also seen in organs which have an end arterial circulation. Therefore, when that particular artery is blocked, the entire area supplied by that artery undergoes ischemic necrosis. Because of the decreased blood in that area and the necrosis, it appears pale or white. Here is an example of a white infarct seen in myocardium. This is a case of transmural myocardial infarction. Similarly, you can see the white infarct involving the spleen in the right picture. Red infarct on the contrary results when there is venous occlusion. Because of the blockage of the outflow of venous blood, there is suffusion of that tissue with blood and congestion which is responsible for the red color of these infarcts. It is seen in ovarian and testicular torsion where these organs twist around their pedicle causing venous occlusion. It is also seen in loose textured tissues like lung parenchyma. Another area in which it is seen is those which are supplied by a dual blood supply, for example, lung and intestine. When one of the vein, uh, veins is blocked, blood from the other vessel suffuses the tissue and becomes it becomes red. Tissues which have sluggish blood flow or also in which blood flow is re-established after a blockage will undergo red infarction. The picture on the left here shows you lung parenchyma with a red infarction. So when we look at the gross morphology of infarcts, we describe it by shape, usually wedge shaped, by color, is it pale, white, or red and hemorrhagic. As an infarct develops, after about one to two days, the viable tissue at the periphery sets up an inflammatory response. Thus, after 48 hours, this infarcted area becomes well delineated by a red margin of inflammation, a sharp demarcation or a sharp margin. The consistency with the necrosis that forms the tissue becomes softer, but once granulation tissue with fibrosis develops and replaces the infarcted area, the infarcted area becomes more firm in consistency because of the underlying scar tissue. The surface, on the cut surface, usually that area will show us the color, the consistency which is softer, whereas the capsule of that organ which is involved will show 
an opacification of the capsule which is normally translucent and shiny. For example, here we have a segment of small intestine that has undergone infarction because of a mesenteric vessel being occluded by a thromboembolus. You can see that the cirrhosal surface of the uninvolved portion is shining and glistening. However, the involved portion it appears dull and opaque. This is another example of infarction of the small intestine after mesenteric thromboembolism. This is a specimen of the testis which has undergone complete infarction following torsion of the testis around its pedicle. When we look at these tissues microscopically, in most ischemic infarctions, the tissue shows coagulative necrosis. When there is a septic infarction or in brain tissue, it is liquefactive necrosis that is seen on microscopy. In case of septic infarcts, because of the suppuration in the center of the ischemic area, abscess formation results and pus will be seen. The wedge shape may be replaced by an irregular shaggy cavity filled with pus. At the margins, after one to two days of infarction, an inflammatory response develops resulting in a hyperemic border. Gradually, the necrotic tissue in infarcted areas is phagocytosed and replaced by macrophages and neutrophils that phagocytose the cellular debris. During this period of necrosis and degradation, the infarcted area becomes softened and yellow. Granulation tissue grows in from the periphery of the infarcted area. Fibroblasts enter the area and lay down collagenous tissue. This forms scar tissue, which is then remolded over the next few weeks to months to re result in a more stable scar. When such scars are present for a prolonged period of time, dystrophic calcification can result and that area can become very hard. Gangrene is a type of infarction only it is on a larger scale and involves a mixture of tissues right from skin to bones if it involves the limbs or it could involve the entire wall of the bowel. When infarctions occur in various tissues, the clinician will usually use various tests to diagnose it. These tests depend on the release of various products from the infarcted necrotic cells into the circulation. Each of the sites will have specific markers which indicate infarction of those areas. The products that may re be released from these necro cells can be protein, it can be a variety of enzymes like AST, ALT and alkaline phosphatase. CPK or creatinine phosphokinase can be re released from infarcted skeletal muscle. Similarly, lactate dehydrogenase where of various types is seen when various cells are infarcted. We have now gone through the definition of infarction which means an area of ischemic necrosis resulting from hypoxia. We have seen the various causes which we divided into arterial, venous and microcirculation causes. We saw the factors of the normal circulation which can influence the development of infarction. We classified the infarcts under various subtypes based on the color, based on the location and so on. The morphology of ulcers we said are of, in, sorry, of infarctions are usually wedge shaped lesions with the apex pointing towards the occluded vessels and the lab diagnosis depends on a number of molecules that are released from the necrosed or infarcted cells. Thank you.